Thank you all for coming. On behalf of John Hamry, our president and CEO, uh, we welcome you to CSIS. I know that many of you have been here before. Uh, this is our continuing series to introduce you to the most recent thought, thoughts and books on national security strategy. Uh, tonight, as you know, we have Harlan Ullman with us and to discuss his new book, uh, Anatomy of Failure. Uh, I will make some introductory remarks and then turn it over to Harlan to give us a precy of his book. This, I believe, is your sixth book, something like that. Tenth. Tenth book, excuse me. Uh, I think he's been writing ever since he graduated from the Naval Academy, but anyway. Uh, and learned to write after that. <laughs> I, I might touch yes, upon please. that. I just finished a study, two-year study on, an, on the war colleges, and something that <laughs> Harlan and I have discussed before, but I did ask a number of professors at the War Colleges, what was the single most deficient talent of the students that you have coming to see you? Lieutenant colonels and colonels, captains, commanders. Their ability to write, and their ability to write concisely and compellingly, which this gentleman doesn't have a problem with. How he learned it over the years, it's probably because He's written 10 books. In any event, um, Harlan, as you have, uh, may know, of course, a Naval Academy graduate, Swift Boat Commander in I Corps in Vietnam, uh, Fletcher School at Tufts, PhD, uh, advisor to SACUR for at least a decade. A dozen years. Yep, and uh, now uh, an advisor to Benz, the Business Executives for National Security, the Atlantic Council and uh, a newly appointed professor, pro bono? Pro bono and no students at the Naval War at College. At the Naval War College. Um, reading this book, as I indicated to Harlan a few minutes ago, brought me back to my youth. In 1965, Harlan goes off to Vietnam as a Lieutenant JG to command a swift boat up an I Corps. Uh, three years later, I was a young soldier in the central highlands of Vietnam, uh, dealing with the Montagnard tribesmen and some other <clears throat> issues and people. Um, but Harlan's recollections here of those years as a young man in Vietnam, which I suspect uh, infected him in terms of his skepticism about the ability of this country to think strategically uh, and even more importantly, to act st strategically. Uh, struck a note with me because as a young soldier up in the Central Highlands with a special task force, I was amazed at some of this silliness, that's not strong enough, some of the <laughs> stupidity that was exhibited by, shall we say, commands above my pay grade. Um, on the other hand, some incredible heroes that I served with and I know if you read this book, there are several anecdotes in there about Harlan's experiences as a swift boat commander up in I Corps, uh, especially about some of the enlisted men, young and not so young, who served with us. Anyway, my uh, crosses in my career and his career have been uh, numerous, although we didn't really meet each other until several years ago. Um, but we've always had in our discussions a deep-seated skepticism and yet appreciation for what it means to lead the national security apparatus of this country. And of course it begins with the president uh, and then extends as the National Military Command Authority through the Secretary of Defense to the combatant commanders. Or as Harlan points out in his book, formerly known as the Sinks, and Rumsfeld, one of my former bosses, uh, decided to change that name because he correctly, and I think Harlan <laughs> points this out, early in his career as the second time as Secretary of Defense, reviewed the warfighting plans of the regional combatant commanders uh, to find that many of them hadn't been reviewed nor updated in many years. And that was the correct thing to do. Nonetheless, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit 
in the beginning here about what I thought, in my view, was the thesis of his book. And it's uh, really uh, as follows here on page 213. Not that you have to wait till 213 to know what the thesis is, <laughs> but it, he, because he does reprise it several times, since, quote, since the latter half of the 20th century, America has lost wars it started or provoked and has failed in military interventions for the same reasons. The fundamental source of these failures can be found in the overall absence of sound strategic thinking and judgment and in the lack of sufficient knowledge or understanding of the circumstances. Harlan and I, as young men, recognized that our senior leadership in this country did not understand the situation uh, or have sufficient knowledge of the understanding uh, of the circumstances politically in Vietnam. And that, suffice it to say, presented us with the platform for failure. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out uh, in uh, his book, and I will go fast forward to, quote unquote, the, the, uh, the solution to the problem that he articulates, which is, quote, brains-based approach. I think in a previous conversation, Harlan mentioned that perhaps Colin Powell thought that was a bit of an arrogant uh, phrase. Very arrogant. Very arrogant, underlined. However, I will say that, to quote on page 211, the brains-based approach to sound strategic thinking consists of three parts. And here is where I'm going to be a little critical of Harlan's position. Complete knowledge and full understanding of all aspects of the problem set and solutions. My experience over the last 40 plus years, both in the public and the private sectors, is it's rare, if ever, that one has complete knowledge. I agree with you. Um, now, having said that, that doesn't mean you don't try to gain it. But time is never, in my experience, on the side of the decider in a crisis. So imperfect information, imperfect knowledge is always at the forefront of I any agree, I agree with you. set of decisions. Harlan, over to you for your praise. Um, thank you. Ray and I have done this so often that while I may be speaking words, you don't even see his lips moving. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank CSIS and John Hamry and Jackie Ramsey for setting this up. Thank you, and you, Ray, for taking the time and for all of you coming here. When I left the Navy about 150 years ago, I came to CSIS when Dave Abshire was still the president and had the extraordinary good fortune of rooming with Admiral Tom Mora, who had been Chief of Naval Operations and then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And I probably learned more just chit-chatting with Tom than I learned in 300 years in the Navy. Um, I will be very brief in my commentary because I'm sure you have lots and lots of questions and Ray has done a brilliant job of summarizing the basis for the book. Um, I guess that the reason I wrote this book was going back more than 50 years. I had been very, very concerned with whenever we started a war or whenever we used military force for the wrong reasons, we failed. Now, let me say that there's a subtitle to the book, What Do We Do to Make Sure That Doesn't Happen Again? And at the very beginning, I want to make the point that the wars in which we were forced to enter, we won. World War I. World War II, most importantly the Cold War, and the first Iraq War. We won those outright. Those were magnificent victories. But ironically, when we ignored all the reasons for why we won those wars, we lost. And I will just take you through with seven league boots a very, very brief summary of those just to get you acquainted with my thinking. Obviously, Vietnam we lost for every reason that Ray said and others. We had no idea what we were doing. We were going to pay any price, bear any burden. We are going to stop the commies, as Lyndon Johnson said to me personally, on the Mekong and not on the Mississippi. We lost the second Iraq war because we had the view that somehow Saddam was engaged in 9-11 and he was not, and that somehow he had this fiction of weapons of mass destruction, but most importantly because by democratizing the greater Middle East, as George W. Bush had an epiphany, we were going to change the geostrategic landscape. 
George Bush was absolutely right. We changed it for the wrong reasons. But even when we had relatively small uses of force, the Bay of Pigs back in 1961, which was not a US military, but it was a US design operation, was catastrophic. You move forward to <clears throat> the Reagan administration. You have Beirut in October of 1983. 241 Marines and service personnel are killed. You have Grenada just a few days later, in which we go in to save 233 military, uh, medical students who were Americans, who according to the operational commander then, Joe Metcalf, were not in danger to prevent the Cubans from building an air base for the Soviet Union, which in fact was being built by the British government, by the Plessy Corporation, which was probably more right wing than you can, you can possibly imagine. We skip through to Iran, Contra, Nicaragua, the mining of the harbors. 1993, you probably have seen the movie Black Hawk Down, Somalia. 1999, 78 days to force Slobodan Milosevic to withdraw from Kosovo. It took us 100 hours to smash Saddam and the largest army in the Middle East in 1991. Then you progress through, uh, I mentioned Iraq the second time, but in 2011, uh, Barack Obama decides to attack Libya to save the people in Benghazi and precipitates a revolution and a civil war. Ray very, very nicely summarized the three reasons. First, as Jack Kennedy said, there's no school for presidents, but certainly the last four presidents, and even before them, were not ready for prime time. And I'm pessimistic whether the next president will be ready for prime time. Their strategic judgment was flawed for a variety of reasons, and the knowledge and understanding was derelict. I made the point about uh, Granada. Uh, when Jim Jones was national security advisor, and I talk about this in the book, I was called in because for my sins, I was dealing with Pakistan, commuting to Pakistan basically once a month for about four years when Asif Zadari was president. And Jim brought in the so-called two experts on Pakistan who were two young ladies who were absolutely clueless. And this was information that was being provided to the president of the United States. There are many reasons for this. First, the issues today are really tough. If there were easy solutions, we would have them. How do you deal with North Korea? How do you deal with the Middle East? How do you deal with Saudi Arabia, which may progress and may not? How do you deal with what's happening in Israel with the Palestinians? How do you deal on and on and on and on? These are not easy. So even if we had a Clausewitz or a Lincoln or an Eisenhower, I'm not sure they would have better solutions. Second, our government is broken. Let me repeat, our government is broken. One party has gone way over, the other party has gone way over. Look what's happening on the Hill by comparison with this tax bill, and I'm a firm, a firm independent. This tax bill the Senate just passed is nonsense. In 1986, Ronald Reagan, whether you liked him or not, passed a tax bill with how many Democratic votes? It was huge, but we've lost the ability for civility and compromise. Thirdly, presidents bring to bear aspirations and intentions that are not achievable. We're going to pay any price, bear any burden. We're going to democratize the greater Middle East. We're going to revolutionize Afghanistan. When you have these aspirations that are impossible to achieve, you can't win. Groupthink. The president is, obviously, the chief executive, the commander in chief. And while we don't have a king, he is both head of state, head of government. Because of that, people are inclined always to support the president. Groupthink was in its ascendance when we went to war in 2003. We talked about knowledge and understanding. We lack it in too many cases. Before September 11th, really no people knew the difference between Sunnis and Shias. But the same thing was true in Vietnam. The same thing was true in Grenada. Putting Marines ashore in Beirut did not make any sense. And both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense then argued against that. Um, so how do we fix this? Can we fix all these issues that I've, I've called about? In the book, I spend a lot of time recommending prescriptions across the board. My first and most important is a brains-based approach. And Ray outlined some of it. The first is understanding that this is the 21st century and not the 20th century. Now, I think the current administration, if you listen to Rex Tillerson or Jim Mattis or H.R. McMaster, understand that the 21st century is different that because of the interrelationships, interconnections, what happens in one part of the world affects the other. Jerusalem is a classic case in point. 
But my view is that we're still using constructs and concepts from the 20th century, such as containment and deterrence, which worked in a bipolar world. And remember, the 20th century was largely bipolar. In the First World War, it was the Allies versus the Central Powers. It was then the Allies versus the Axis, East versus West. That is no longer the case. And so the notion of deterrence, when you had two superpowers who could destroy the world, preventing conflict, no longer applies. For example, we have the best Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps in the world. How do you defeat an enemy that doesn't have one? How do you defeat an idea? And so we need new concepts to deal with this. The Russians are not going to attack West. I guarantee you, you can take that to the bank, even though many people will disagree with that assessment. But they have something called active measures that we mistakenly called hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare is older than Sun Tzu. It's older than the Soviet Union. But we have not been able to adapt to dealing with active measures because it exceeds the military's capacity to do with this. So what I'm saying is that we need new constructs for the 21st century. Second, knowledge and understanding. I argue for the equivalent of Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park, as you know, broke some of the codes during World War II and had a very, very real impact on the outcome of the war. We need a Bletchley Park arrangement that looks at open source material so that we have a far better understanding of cultures, of societies, of parts of the world that we do not know well enough. And what we need to do within the government is establish a kind of a Wikipedia. Whether you're in the Commerce Department, you're in the Treasury Department, Department of Defense, you can access this so you get a far better understanding. And thirdly, we need to focus on the will and perception of a particular target, albeit a friend, an adversary, or somebody who's neutral. We have to be able to affect, influence, and control, if necessary, will and perception. And military force may or may not be necessary to this. The issue is not whether you kill yourself to victory, kill your way to victory, which we tried to do unsuccessfully in Vietnam, which I think we're trying to do in the war, so-called war against terror. But you have to affect the brains. Vladimir Putin understands this brilliantly. We have to do that. So that's the first thing, a brains-based approach. Second, in each of the departments, and I'll go through this very, very quickly. In the NSC, we need to have a red team that challenges assumptions. The president has recognized Jerusalem. What were the basic assumptions? What, were the, what, were the, what was the strategy that was meant to be achieved by doing this sort of thing? Unless we are able to challenge ruthlessly these assumptions, as George Marshall said, if you get the aims right, a lieutenant can write the strategy. That may be somewhat simplistic, but too often we have misplaced assumptions and they have got to be ruthlessly challenged. In Congress, Congress has got to be a board for the takeoff and it's going to be on board for the landing. And I argue in the book for the equivalent of a National Security Council. Now the President, uh, the Vice President of the United States has really one specific duty aside from waiting if something should happen to the President. He is President of the Senate. So why not convene the 10 or 12 most important members of both houses of Congress with the Vice President as President of the Senate as the Chairman? This is a mini NSC which can then relate with the NSC in the White House so that we have closer collaboration and discussion because both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue are millions of miles apart for the wrong reason. In the Department of Defense, I've argued that because strategy is so important and across government, the people who tend to be the most non-ideological and probably the best educated for whatever reasons and would do deference to the State Department are in the Department of Defense. I believe you need to separate the Joint Chiefs of Staff from the service chiefs. You have separate service chiefs who deal with their service secretaries to carry out Title X of the law, train, up, equip, and maintain. But you have the Joint Chiefs who provide strategic advice. That is their particular role. They do this full time. Now, there are a number of other things, and I also pick on education, particularly and Ray has worked on this in the Department of Defense. We have huge assets, but we do not, do not exploit them. For example, at the lowest level where you graduate officers, 
from West Point, the Naval Academy, and the Air Force Academy. We graduate second lieutenants and ensigns with bachelor's degrees. We don't maintain, we don't graduate naval officers, marine officers, army officers, and air force officers. And if you don't believe me, read the reports on the recent collisions of the US Navy to make that. If you go all the way up the ranks to flag officers, one, two, three, four stars, how much time do we have give them to prepare for their next billet? The answer is basically zero. I work with four sac yours. They were all extraordinarily able people. Jim Jones, John Craddock, Jim Stavridis, and Phil Breedlove. They all had zero time to prepare. That is insane. You wouldn't do that in industry. You wouldn't do that any place. So we have to use education and training in an entirely different light. We can do that. It's going to cost us nothing because we've got billions and billions of dollars that we've already got placed. It requires a rationality to put these things together and to put somebody in charge. And I would point out, in terms of being in charge, one of the problems of our stovepipe government is that it's very difficult to see who's in charge. For example, who's in charge of cyber in the United States? And you're not going to get a very good answer. Let me conclude. Let me just say that despite these problems that we face, the threats are not existential, in my mind. I do not see Russia as existential. I do not see China as existential. I do not see North Korea as existential. Nor do I see the Islamic State. There was an attack in New York City, as you know, the other day. We kill more people in the United States by a factor of 10 or 50 through drug overdoses and gun violence than we're going to be seen killed by terrorists. So that we have to be far more rational. So the nature of an existential threat is not there. We have a broken government, and what does that mean? It doesn't mean the barbarians are at the gate, but it does mean that the American promise is going to be far more elusive for future generations to achieve. It means that your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, unless you leave them $100 million or more, are not going to be as well off as you and I are today. That's the direction we're headed. This is not a crisis in that sense, but it's a problem. It's more akin to having a bad case of the flu than a life-threatening cancer. But we as Americans have to realize this is the trajectory. And the only way we turn this around, unless there is a huge super crisis as bad as the Depression, as bad as Pearl Harbor, is for American citizens to realize the future is in our hands. And unless we demand of our government better action, we will receive the government that we deserve. And on the current track, I'm not very, very happy with that. I will be delighted to listen and answer your questions. And thank you very much for taking the time to be here. And Ray, thank you very much. Thank you, Harlan. Uh, it seems to me that I will take the privilege of the chair. This book really attacks, addresses two levels, the strategic level, beginning with the president. And as you point out in your book, uh, ab uh, apart from Bush 41, George H.W. Bush. Who never got reelected. Right. Sinful. Right. Setting that aside for the moment. Yep. Uh, he was the only one prepared for the presidency by virtue of his background. Since, since Nixon and Eisenhower. Right. Um, you just talked about your institutional organizational recommendations. Um, so before I talk about the lower level down, and it goes back to our experience in Rusi two summers ago. Um, you say that the service chiefs ought not be members of the Joint Chiefs. I take issue with that. If they were not members of the Joint Chiefs, it seems to me they would become de facto this cabal on the sidelines, harping and carping, and not necessarily supporting the SECDEP. I want you to respond, obviously. Sure. I like your idea, however, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the vice chairman ought to have access to, on a continuing basis, a group of senior officers who have had both operational combat experience and, let's call it, E-ring experience, and geopolitical experience. And who are those people today? They're your combat and regional combat and commanders. Why are they not part of or more integrated into that strategic formulation thinking process? Yeah. Uh, we could spend 
10 hours in that. Rudy de Leon probably has, as Deputy Secretary of Defense, has some very, very good ideas on that. Uh, first, no organization is perfect. There's always going to be a downside, and there's a risk of what you said. During the interwar years, we had a general board. And this is, this is your advisors. The trouble with advisors is that they then seem as usurping uh, the power of the Joint Chiefs and the Service Chiefs. Um, <clears throat> one of the fundamental problems we have is the UCP, Unified Command Plan, is out of whack with reality. It needs to be changed. Uh, we've listened too much to the uh, unified commanders in the field, and I've been part of that. Just because they have all these requirements, somebody needs to vent those requirements much more carefully. One of the great things that Don Rumsfeld did was to go through the war plans, which he found extraordinary, as you remember, because they were not coordinated, they were not realistic, so forth. And too often the Didn't commanders- Didn't cross lines. Didn't cross AOR. Of course not. Of course not. And so one of the problems is we have, in my mind, a unified command plan, which is profoundly flawed. For example, who's in charge in Africa? You've got four or five different, four commands that are competing there. So you've got to fix that, and I can give you some suggestions. Um, you also need much more discipline. And I think that if you had the, you would be subordinating the service chiefs, which I think needs to be done, because quite frankly, if we don't improve the efficiency and effectiveness of how the service operates, we're going to be spending ourselves into a black hole. And one of the things, as you know, I'm concerned about, I believe not only are we going to lead to a hollow force, we are already in a condition where we have a hollow force because internal cost growth is driving us crazy, because we have a overall management bureaucratic scheme that's impossible. It was, I like to say, developed by the KGB because no rational personal person could have done it. And I don't understand how the Pentagon functions at all. And so it seems to me that what I want is the basis for strategic advice, and I think the way to do that, it will have downsides. The other point I didn't make in this revolution in education, I think we need to change the National Defense University into the National Security University. And it needs to have a four-star equivalent in charge, and it needs to have more people from the other branches of government, Commerce, Treasury, Department of Homeland Security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Attorney General, because security can no longer be defined in the 21st century strictly along military lines, and too often we've allowed the military, unfortunately, to be the de facto solution for security. That's not the answer, and we have to have a much more broader way of dealing with this, and I think a national security university is one way of approaching it. Well, there's no question that if whole of government is more than just a of bumper course. sticker, you've got to start training, educating, and deploying together. Absolutely. Uh, and we do not do that, unfortunately. We, we don't do it anywhere near. Interestingly enough, and I hate going back to Vietnam, my experiences in military intelligence for Southern Problems Institute Corps, I worked with the agency, I worked with the State Department, I worked with USAID, even though I had a uniform on. And many of the State Department uh, young men in those days uh, who went on to become multiple ambassadors and career ambassadors all cut their teeth in Vietnam. Of course. And, uh, but there's something I wanted to bring up before I turn to the audience. Someone recently was talking about how ISIS has lost their caliphate. The land has been <laughs> carved back into Iraq, for instance. And I read the other day that while that is true, cyberspace is now the new caliphate. Of course. So two summers ago, in 2015, Harlan and I were at the Royal United Services Institute Annual Land Warfare Conference with Sir Nick Carter, Commanded General Staff, and he made an announcement, which I think was an announcement or it was an admission of what he had already put into place, the 77th Regiment and the ISR, I, Brigade. ISR Brigade. How do you see those examples that the British Army has done that we ought to repeat. Thank you. And we have Brigadier James Carr Smith here, who is a British uh, Army attache. Um, Nick Carter, who is the Chief of General Staff, and maybe he'll become Chief of Defense Staff, we'll see, in Britain, is an extraordinarily able officer. And his view was two things. One, what do we do about the non-kinetic aspects of warfare that are so really important, and how do we integrate intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And so we formed two new brigades, 77 Brigade and ISR Brigade. 77 Brigade was meant to be looking at uh, 
all the things that we can do non-kinetically, which is psychologically, which is shock and awe. They have since been formed into a division. James, is that division formed yet? As, as, and Tom is going to, uh, Ma Major General Tom Coppinger Symes is going to take command of that. Uh, I have discussed this with the Chief of Staff here, U.S. Army. This is a brilliant idea in terms of experimentation. How do you form the nexus for whole of government? And I think we need to do more. The U.S. Army, as you may or may not know, is really moving into future warfare thinking. They've formed a new command to do that. I think this is, has to be far more widespread across the department. We're trying to do that at Newport, uh, but the point is we have to incorporate more than so-called war fighting. We have to get into the psychological, the political, the economic, the social, the cultural issues. And so that we give all of our people who are engaged in security, no matter whether they're in the Commerce Department or the Defense Department, a better toolkit. And 77 Brigade and ISR Brigade, if they work correctly, will enhance the toolkit and enable us to deal with many of these dangers, many of these menaces of the 21st century, as you point out, the problem or the threat from, in my mind, the Islamic State is the internet. A pipe bomb in New York City, come on. You know, you're going to get that from maybe MS-13 and local gangs who want to disrupt. But to be able to self-radicalize people, this is the issue. And as the Russians were clever enough to intercede not only in our elections, but also in Brexit, the Islamic State is using the internet in a very, very, very innovative way. And one of the things we think is because we believe these guys are crazy, women are crazy, they will be suicide bombers, they're not smart. We didn't think the Viet Cong were smart, we didn't think the Taliban were smart. That is a big mistake. I will now ask the audience, and I see several hands. This gentleman will have a microphone to you in a brief moment. If you will identify yourself and your affiliation. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for raising these issues. My name is Paul Sham. I'm a professor of Israel studies at the University of Maryland. I'm not a military or organizational person. So uh, my take on the uh, issues you uh, raise and which are obvious and true and uh, uh, important are is uh, rather different. I think the lack of uh, information that you would talk about and uh, training really wouldn't have uh, changed most of those wars. President Trump did not lack for people telling him it was idiotic to recognize Jerusalem. President Bush had a uh, concept that he went to with. If you go back to the other wars that were uh, badly run, Spanish, American, uh, others, these Professor, were- Professor, your question. Uh, sorry. Uh, my point is, uh, the uh, question is, how can you change uh, the situation with the fact that the, uh, the president must be primarily a politician. Mm -hmm. he, there is no strategic requirement, as we say. And given that the U.S. likes to think its wars are for uh, democracy, he uh, or she no, can't I, I get your point. Okay. Sorry. discuss I, 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 it. You raise a fair point. Um, how do you deal with a president that's bound and determined to do whatever he's going to do, irrespective? And the answer is you don't. Um, and you can't. Uh, there's a vignette in the book. Uh, I had a hate-love, hate relationship with Bob McNamara, Secretary of Defense. And at one stage, this is well after McNamara was out of office, we used to have lunch more than occasionally. And I said, you know, Kennedy really caused the, Bay of, uh, the, caused the Cuban Missile Crisis because Khrushchev, who was then first Secretary, General Secretary, 
was disarming, or I should say reducing, military capacity in Russia. And all of a sudden, Kennedy comes in. He doubles the size of the defense budget. He doubles the size of our nuclear, goes into Bay of Pigs. And I said, you had all this information from Oleg Penkovsky, who had been a GRU disgruntled colonel because he didn't make general. And so he photocopied all these top, above top secret documents of the Anamiso, which was military thought, the general staff journal, which we had. And McNamara basically told me, and then Susan Eisenhower and others separately, it didn't make any difference. The president said there was a missile gap. There was, except we were on the right side of the missile gap. And so you cannot limit. But you put in constraints. If you have an NSC in the Congress, which gives them greater input, if the Joint Chiefs can provide strategic advice, if you have the NSC with a red team that challenges the assumptions, I will bet you nobody said to Donald Trump, what is your strategy, Mr. Trump? They just said, I don't think it's a good idea. So what you have to do is focus on the assumptions and basically have the courage of your convictions to stand up and say, no, Mr. President, this is wrong. It's very difficult to do, but unless you put that in place, presidents will do what they want, sometimes whimsically, and as you rightly point out, it gets us into huge trouble. So there are only a certain amount of things that we can do to try to limit that, but you raise a fundamental flaw in any system where you've got somebody who's the chief executive and commander in chief and has huge power to do whatever he or she may want, sometimes unchecked. As uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Marty Dempsey, General Dempsey has been quoted multiple times saying in the Situation Room, and this pertains not just to Marty and his president, Obama, but others, the president will inevitably say as the crisis is being briefed, General, Admiral, what are my options? And the generals want to say, excuse me, Mr. President, what are your objectives? Tell me your objectives, and then I'll give you your options. And they don't do that. And virtually every president will say, give me the options, because they don't want to state their right. objectives. And this book reminded me a little bit about HR's book, Dereliction of Duty, because there's a dereliction here. But it gets, one of the issues that the professor raises that, that Harlan has in his book is also the issue, president's campaign to gain that office. And they come in with people who help them win that office. But they have to make an adjustment to governance. And that is difficult. I've been in several transitions of several presidencies, and both from R's to D's and D's to R's. And if a president doesn't recognize that he has to make that adjustment, especially when it comes to national security, and cannot access the most able citizens of our country, to sit in those, to take those positions for various reasons, then he inevitably runs into problems early on, even without a crisis. Yep. Next question. Yes, right up here. Thank you, Harlan. My name is Suleiman Vasti. I served with the UN in Iraq. And I saw with my own eyes three groups of enablers, the aid industry, the refugee industry, and forget about the defense industry, the Halliburtons and KBRs, which were the beneficiaries of the interventions. You know, like reconstruction efforts, the money pouring in, the recreate the refugees. And so these are the beneficiaries, and you have these vested interests one has to deal with. So creating the National Security University, there should be these elements which should be also taken oh, into agree. account. I absolutely agree. It has to be very, very, very diverse. And just because I didn't name all the elements, does it mean we don't have to have more elements? Yes, sir. A fellow swift boat skipper. Thank you. Uh, uh, Harlan, you gave this list of uh, wars of uh, choice. Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't like Richard Hawes's. I, no, I don't like that discussion. They're wars of mistake. There's a big difference. I'll ask it a different way. You gave a list of wars which uh, we didn't win. Yeah. And uh, it appears that in almost all of those, maybe with the exception of Somalia and Beirut, you know, we'd won all or most of all the battles in those. Can you talk a little bit about the, the difference between winning the battles and actually winning the war? Um, you know the old saying, as the North Vietnamese reminded us constantly, the Americans won most of the battles, we lost the war. <laughs> 
tactics versus strategy. In fact, the North Vietnamese on one occasion, I was speaking to some of them years later, and they said actually we were following George Washington's strategy. Washington really only beat the British twice, Saratoga, and then at Virginia Capes. The Battle of Princeton. <laughs> Three times. The point is, you can win by not losing. And the fact of the matter is, the tactics don't count. It's the overarching strategy. And at the end of the conflict, do you come out ahead or behind? One of the problems is that we have a superb military, but we expect the military, in many cases, to achieve objectives that it's not capable of achieving. It cannot build nations. It cannot democratize. It's very, very good in destroying other militaries. But when it's not fighting another military or other ideas, it's very much limited also by Title X and the law. And so there are definite constraints here. And when we lose, we lose because we have the wrong objectives, which are not feasible. And then we depend really on what is seen as the most reliable tool, the military, but it's not big enough to be able to achieve political or strategic objectives that have to come from other sources. Way in the back, I want to get that young man in the blue shirt. Hi, my name is Zach. In the situations that you described where the U.S. government didn't have enough information in order to wage right. successful campaigns, would you put that burden of failure on the intelligence community or the foreign service officers or another government institution for not being able to get the necessary information? Well, that, that's a good question. You have to spread out the responsibility. In some cases, we had the information. I, I talked about the Penkovsky papers, but the White House wasn't going to believe it. Weapons of mass destruction, we knew that curveball was a fraud. But because of groupthink, it just did not penetrate. There were other areas like Grenada where we just failed. We simply failed. Uh, certainly cases in, in, in Vietnam, we were uninformed. And in, in, in many cases, we do not have the access. But generally speaking, uh, it's not that the information is not available, the intelligence is not available. Either one, we are just not smart enough to see it, or two, it's ignored. And you have to overcome that. And there's no guarantee, there's no antidote, there's no inoculation to make sure that doesn't happen. But in most every case, the information is available beforehand. It's a question of having a process which can get it to a president or a leader, and then make sure that he understands what it means before a decision is, is taken. There is, of course, that reference to slam dunk and George Tenet, and what he briefed Colin Powell, President, Vice President, SecDef. Well, there were two, two, two sessions. Uh, over the weapons of mass, we knew better. Uh, because as I said, Curveball was a fraud. Curveball was an Iraqi who came through German intelligence who said he got all this kind of stuff. If you asked any of the military commanders, uh, Tony Zinni being the most important, uh, Desert Fox took place in, I think, 2000. I can't remember the exact date. But at that state, this is a punitive rage, a raid against Saddam Hussein. We had taken out all of his at WMD. And unfortunately, nobody wanted to listen. And that's the issue. And so you get stuck in those situations. George Tenet was not an intelligence officer. He was a politician. What was his job before he became director of CIA? He was on the Hill, mm -hmm. staff director. And group think took over. And it's very easy when you have, when you have a villain. I mean, who was going to like Saddam Hussein? And you had all these disparate pieces of information. Uh, go back to the Joe Wilson aluminum pipes, Valerie Plain business, all these things. This is a guy who gassed people. He used gas. He used poison gas against Iran. He was a villain. So it was very, very easy to take all these pieces of information and say, aha. But there was no red team That's in place key. to criticize that when all that information was available. And by the way, it didn't make any difference. Uh, I think George W. Bush had an epiphany after September 11th. He said so in his autobiography. He said so publicly. And I think uh, Bush is a very underestimated president. I think his last year or two, he was a, a very, very competent president. The costs of tuition were probably unaffordable. But I think he really believed that if I can democratize the Middle East through Iraq, I can change the landscape for the better. And I think that really drove him. And so information that was contrary to that 
And I know from very personal discussions with people who were very, very close to Bush then that there was an ideological view on the part of Bush this was going to be the solution. And in some cases, it's very difficult to force somebody off that position, just as Jack Kennedy was convinced the missile gap existed with Russia when it did, but it was in our favor. Yeah, whether it's dereliction of duty or anatomy of failure, I've been interested in reading this book. How do you address the issue of civilian leadership and its relationship and, and um, arguably the civilian control issue? Authority, direction, and control resides with the Secretary of Defense, sure. period. Right. And everybody, COCOMs report directly to him. Correct. So in your view of, in your conclusions of how we should change the dynamic, the strategic thinking dynamic, what's the role of civilian leadership? Well, it's crucial. Um, I, 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 I admire Jim Mattis enormously. As do I. All the good stories about Jim Mattis are true. This is a remarkable guy. Uh, he also has a sense of humor. When he was taking the first, and I'll get to your answer in a second, but it's important to understand about Mattis. He was leading the 1st Marine Division up to Baghdad in 2003 from the front. Mattis tells the story on himself. And he's in the front lines, and there's a Marine blazing away with an M16. And Mattis says, I ask a question so stupid only a general could ask the question. Marine, how's it going? And the Marine, according to Mattis, says, sir, I'm taking the fun out of fundamentalist. Okay. Mattis is magnificent. I, I am concerned with a military guy being Secretary of Defense because how is he going to think about his job? It's going to be his last 40 years of service in the military. And the reason we have civilian leadership is because civilian leadership hopefully can think much, much more broadly. Now, one of the things we have to do, because this whole trans, and this will get to your answer, the transition period from the time a president gets elected until he's, he or she is sworn in on January 20th is not sufficient to be able to recruit really good people. Some cases you are really lucky. Uh, I was not close to the Trump transition, but I was in Trump Tower on several occasions between the election and January 20th. Chaos is not a strong enough word to describe what was going on. So what we need to do is pre-screen people in both parties who would be eligible and begin vetting them for security clearance so that you have a wider reservoir of people from whom to choose. Um, and that's why I like the idea of this NSC of Congress because Congress should have its appointees that it's prepared to have, less so for political or reasons of expediency, which is very difficult to do because people who are very, very loyal want to come into the administration. But unfortunately, it's one of the potential downsides and weaknesses of our system of government. That a president comes in with very, very little experience, he is going to appoint people who have been loyal to him or useful in the campaign, rather than necessarily appointing people who may have the competence. And on the other side of the coin, a lot of people don't want to serve in government. One of the things we have to do, because government is so highly, in, highly intrusive in everything you've done in your life, We've got to clear up some of these rules about conflict of interest to make it much more palatable for people to give up, in many cases, how much money did Rumsfeld give up? What did it cost him for his clearances? Huge. We have to make it much easier for people to come into government and not make it a detriment so that you get the best and the brightest, and you really, even though that didn't work in Vietnam, but still it's an, it's an objective we'd like to have, and then makes the situation, the conditions such that it's easier to get people in rather than presenting barriers to prevent their service. Uh, this lady here. Hi. Oh, yes, uh, Sandra Sham. Uh, I'm a professor of anthropology at Catholic University and also a CBE consultant to state and USAID. And the question I wanted to ask had to do with your, uh, your um, remarks with respect to training yeah and one of the uh, one of the research projects i did was to compare the cords program to the prt iraq and right. afghanistan programs and i know so one aspect uh, well the one tell them what cords and prt uh, are because cords, most people cords was a civil military program in vietnam and um, it mostly involves civilians going out into the field actually talking to real people in vietnam and doing <laughs> doing development Type work, uh, types of work, and PRTs, uh, pro provincial reconstruction teams, you're probably familiar with the 
to, same in sort Afghanistan, of thing. In Afghanistan, these were teams that were supposed to help nation building. Yeah. There were 18 of them. They were in different parts of, 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 of Afghanistan. They were not coordinated, and they belonged to different nationalities, so they were very uneven in their ability to do anything. Well, as an anthropologist, I saw the one glaring difference being that the CORDS program had a great deal of training in language and culture. The PRT program yep. had virtually none, <laughs> or a week's training, actually. I think I, I worked on that training myself when I was yep. at USAID. But um, my, my question is, in terms of, um, of giving people the type of training they need in order to do this kind of work, um, and of course, there is also the question of whether they should be doing that kind of work anyway, but uh, that's another, another issue. Uh, how much training do you really think people should have? I mean, should they, should they really take a deep dive into language and culture, or do you think that the CORDS model was actually a good one? The trouble with CORDS um, was that it got confused with, with Operation Phoenix. Operation Phoenix was an assassination program. We killed 50, 60, 70, 80,000 Vietnamese who we thought were bad guys. So there were aspects of CORDS. This is revolutionary development. And the trouble was you had a corrupt government, so even in the provinces, it was not going to be able to work. My argument has been that we have to, we have to focus, and the Army is doing this with, with, with brigades, I guess, that are teamed with other countries. I think from the time you enter, in this case, the military, but obviously the State Department, CIA, you need to have a regional expertise, and you need to be able to focus on one or two countries as your expertise. And as you get to be more senior, you then develop friendships with people who become more senior. I'll give you a graphic example of this. Uh, Shukri Ghanem was a Libyan student at the Fletcher School uh, who was not interested in a degree. He was interested in all the co-eds. And he became, he was a good friend of mine. And in 2001, Shukri, who was on Gaddafi's hit list, became oil minister. And I called Colin Powell, Secretary of State, saying, I think Gaddafi's coming out of the closet. No, 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 no. Shukri then becomes prime minister. And it was clear that Gaddafi really decided that he was going to give up his weapons of mass destruction. Well, we need to develop relationships as you get older and older and older. For example, Tony Zinni was uh, Pervez Musharraf's, the president of Pakistan's teacher at the Marine Corps staff, uh, staff school. We need to develop those relationships so that people have a real expertise in these regions before a crisis. So that, for example, if something breaks out somewhere, you know you've got a coterie of 100 people who have been skilled in this and have the language and culture, not just in the State Department, but across the board. One of the problems in the CIA is you've got to be a manager. And so it takes away from the analyst's ability to become masters in their particular area. So I could not agree with you more. We have to have more cultural. We have to have more uh, education as opposed to training in different regions of the world, which become part of your specialty, whatever branch of service you in, State Department, the Department of Defense, or whatever. Yes, uh, in the front, in the second row, right here. And then I'll get to you, sir. Dan Roper, Association of the United States Army. As you're familiar with, the, the military focuses on what has been called phase three, major combat, decisive sure. operations, army against army, and really doesn't, isn't cut out to be the expert in the other domains, as you've suggested already. What, what is being done or what do you suggest in your, in your book about getting to phase zero, phase one, phase two, which is really preparing sure. for combat when we're actually being attacked in those domains right now in the information realm, and in particular cyber, in Russia, next generation warfare, Absolutely. and other, other actors. So we're at war and we don't even know it. My, my view is, and I go back to this revolution education, this is imperative for enlisted as well as officers. When he was a buck sergeant, he probably had greater impact on his battalion. Everybody is really important. And so unless we begin to prepare people from the very time they enter service, and I'm talking about the foreign service, so forth, um, we have to prepare people for a far greater spectrum than just being able to go out and operate tank ships, airplanes, so forth and so on. And it's got to start at entry points. So even when you, are, you go to whatever the basic school is for enlisted people, or officer training, officer education, we have to stretch that horizon. And I think that is essential. And the other advantage is people are going to like doing that. This is exciting. And I think what we have to do is change the way we do our deployments. I don't think it's necessarily important that you have a, a brigade or a ship or an air wing or something. But why don't you send more people 
to other staffs in other countries. We'll let them serve as exchange officers. I was very, very lucky to be an exchange officer in the Royal Navy for two years. My captain went on to be uh, uh, First Sea Lord. For a while, I was stashed at their Naval Academy, and Prince Charles was briefly under my uh, control until they realized they didn't want to yank. But that's what you need to do. You need to expand the horizon for people in the national security area, not just defense. And so from the very beginning, they have to understand not only is it important how you shoot a rifle, but it's important how you understand cyber and all these other kinds of things that are going to affect you directly. And so I think this revolution in, in education is essential. It's not going to cost a lot of money. We already spend a lot of money. And I think it's the best way that we can approach the future. As Churchill said eloquently, we've run out of money. We now have to employ our brains. And sometimes it's very difficult to employ one's brains. Rudy DeLeon, who was in the back of the audience here, uh, was very much involved with the Goldwater Nichols legislation that uh, was consummated in 1986. And that focused on joint service, joint education. You cannot become a general flag officer unless you've done joint duty. We now, to use Harlan's term, we have to shift to the 21st century, in my view, in his view, and have joint education and training across the government and not just in terms of the four military, five with the Coast Guard services. Question back here, Tattersall shirt. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Peter Shutley, retired Foreign Service, but also six years Army ROTC. I appreciate your point that you cannot make a powerful political leader, a president, accept opinions or data or information that they don't want to accept. Combined with that, one of the big problems in the U.S. is that the U.S. military is just too good. So it's too easy to intervene. Oh, we'll send the 82nd there, it's a small thing, just deploy them. Maybe if we had some kind of threshold or some kind of obstacle that had to be overcome before we could act militarily overseas, I'm thinking of two. If we had a draft, I don't think we would have gone into Iraq in uh, 2003 the college campuses would have exploded. Uh, if you have a requirement that you have to pay for the war with a tax increase. So as a president, before he deploys, the 82nd would have to think, how am I going to pay for this? How much is the tax increase going to be? Or we're going to reinstitute national service to call up all the young men and women. They would be less likely to engage in overseas adventures. Um. Colin Powell and Cap Weinberger had the Weinberger Powell doctrine. That gets forgotten. Uh, I think I'd rather have a military that's so good whenever I send it, it's, it's going to win if it's under the right circumstances. Uh, you're not going to get a tax increase to pay for a war, unfortunately. The point you make about the draft, however, is very interesting because I've argued in the book and elsewhere the number one, the two, num the two threats, greatest threats to the American military are uncontrolled internal cost growth, which is going to destroy us. And also this bizarre oversight, regulatory, budget, budgetary process, which is impossible to operate under. I think we're headed towards a hybrid where you have a draft. You have part professional, part draft. You draft some people. And in some time in the future, I think that's going to be essential because the military, not because of its own fault, has become far more close, cloistered around super bases. And therefore, it's far more isolated. And as long as we're at war and the, and the threshold of casualties is low, we're not getting a lot of people killed. This is not in Vietnam where you had a body count of a week that could be 500, 1,000 soldiers. Uh, we only had 148 killed in Desert Storm. I mean, this is a relatively small number, unless, of course, you're one of them. And so I think where we're headed for in the future will be that there's going to have to be some kind of a draft just to engage the American public. It may be only 10 or 20 or 30 percent, but I think that's what's going to happen. And for those of you who say it's infeasible, in 1993, Bill Clinton's number one defense priority was integrating homosexuals into the military. And that crashed. Ten years later, that was not an issue. This is extraordinary in terms of social shifts. And I think those who say we can't get rid of the professional military, we, need, we can't have a draft or something like that, I think in some perhaps shorter order of time, we're going to move to that because it's for the good of the nation. We cannot continue to keep the military cloistered. And quite frankly, it's going to be very difficult to recruit the people we need because if you're not fighting wars, 
if you're dealing with equipment that's broken, you don't have the readiness and esprit. After Vietnam, we had a hollow force. And that hollow force drove a lot of people out of the military. That's where we're headed. So I guess sometime in the future, we're going to move more towards a hybrid force, which will include some kind of a semi-draft. And I think that will be very important to do. I'm going to call it to an end now, and Harlan will be able to, available to sign some more books. There's one sentence, however, Harlan, I wanted you to comment on that I found very o Only one. This is, the, in my view, the most cogent of your many, many <laughs> important sentences. Bless you. Quote, if there is no intention to go to war, does deterrence have any meaning? Precisely. <laughs> to love the one answer? No. <laughs> the idea, whether it's the draft, I was drafted. I think the draft is an unfair tax on America's youth. That doesn't mean, however, that America's youth should not do something in support of their country. And that could be in a number of different ways. Uh, but if you have a professional military, as we do, and one that is well-trained, as it is, and arguably, in most cases, well-led, yeah. notwithstanding it may be flying B-52s that are older than I am and you, but... Not quite. <laughs> But the notion is, if we have that strength, it does deter. But there's the other D that I find very important that we ought not forget about, and that's detente. We need to do both to be a successful leader in this uncertain and dangerous world. Um, I would just say that deterrence of the 20th century no longer applies in the 21st century. The best military in the world is not going to deter Vladimir Putin from making road trips to try to undercut us in Syria, in Egypt, in Iran, and elsewhere. And so therefore, we need broader thinking. We have to expand the spectrum. We can do that, but the only thing that limits us, in my mind, Ray, is the fact that we don't have the imagination, and too often we're not encouraged to have the imagination. Some of the projects that Ray has led here at CSIS in terms of education, organization, and the military are absolutely essential. And I think it's going to require great help from our citizens to demand that our government takes a broader view in dealing with these issues. And unless or until the public becomes sufficiently engaged to demand better government from our government, I think it's pretty clear the direction that we are headed. And as I said, it's not existential, but it is probably more a case of a bad case of the flu than cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you join me in thanking Harlan? And thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Harlan will be out at the table to sign books.